For the most part, a truly successful story has consistency, internal logic, and sick car stunts. Alright, just the first two. But sometimes, like the Nissan Skyline in my screenplay, consistency and internal logic go right out the window, and you're left with a plot hole that, if you stop to think about it, makes no sense at all. So now it's time to think about these plot holes that are so huge you could drive a truck through them, and into oncoming traffic, and then off a bridge, and also Vin Diesel's there and not dying for some reason. I should write this stuff down actually. Bye. Sorry, yes. Please consider these seven huge plot holes that get worse the more you think about them. And beware spoilers for the following games. How much is enough, Kratos? When will it end? When the glory of Sparta is known throughout the world. The glory of Sparta. You did this for yourself. Everyone loves the mature, nuanced protagonist of God of War and God of War Ragnarok, but before there was Dad Kratos, there was Mad Kratos, the infinitely angry anti-hero of the original God of War trilogy who killed ancient Greek gods like I ate today's spaghetti lunch. Messily and without remorse. Oh my god! Yeah. How did this happen? Old school Kratos was a being of pure fury, driven by his one true passion of violently revenging himself on everyone who ever wronged him, which over the course of three games was basically the entire pantheon. Going all the way back though, this roaring rampage of revenge began when Ares, the OG god of war, snuck Kratos' wife and daughter into a temple that bloodthirsty warrior Kratos was in the midst of doing a massacre on. Let that be a lesson I guess to look where you're stabbing. My wife. My child. So it was that Kratos accidentally murdered his own family, set his vengeful sights on Ares, Ares! and the rest is ancient Greek history. I was trying to make you a great warrior. You succeeded. Fast forward to the start of game two, by which time Kratos had already murdered Ares, when he gets murdered in turn by Zeus. <laughs> Unlucky. Being dead, Kratos is dispatched to the underworld where he spends most of the game tracking down the Sisters of Fate who can help him travel back in time and fix things. There is no power greater than the Sisters of Fate. If you challenge us, you will die. Three dead Sisters of Fate later, obviously, Kratos gets his hands on the big magic time travelling undo button that is the Loom of Fate. The power of the Fates resides within these great mirrors. Find your thread, and you will be able to control the mirrors, and use them as a gateway to return to the time when Zeus betrayed you. The loom works like a mystical time machine, displaying various moments from Kratos' past in its portal mirror as he pulls on the thread of his face like he's flipping channels on a TV. Clearly, Kratos could use the loom of fate to travel to any point in his life so far, including the moment before he killed his own family, averting the terrible incident that set him on this bloody path of endless revenge. And yet, what does he do instead of travelling back in time and saving his family? He rewinds time just enough to go back and have another pop at Zeus. Could it be that Kratos is so blinded by rage he doesn't think to undo the thing that got him so mad in the first place? Could it be that revenge is a never-ending cycle that destroys both Revenger and Revengee? What? Could it be that they didn't want to make God of War 3 about Kratos settling down with his family and taking anger management classes? Friends, it could. If all on Olympus would deny me my vengeance, then all on Olympus will die. Mr. Kelso? That's what the sign on the door says, miss. L.A. Noir is a stylish game of intrigue, conspiracy, and wiggling evidence around until Cole Phelps says a thing. Proximity to the scene, plus the bloodstains, no way is this coincidence. Later in the game, you're playing not as Cole Phelps, but fellow hat wearer and professional frenemy Jack Kelso, investigating fraud for the California Fire and Life Insurance Company. In the course of investigating houses built with dangerously inadequate materials, crack investigator Kelso wanders into the Keystone Film Studios and finds a film reel that might just blow this whole case wide open, casually left lying around in a screening room. 
Let's see what the rich and powerful have to say for themselves. There's no film reel inside the container, of course, because we're doing a twisted tale of intrigue and conspiracy here. So the game's not just going to drop key evidence in your... Oh, wait, no, here it is, loaded up in the nearby projector. In a great day for the future of Los Angeles, civic leaders and businessmen join forces to launch the Suburban Redevelopment Fund. The film starts as a newsreel, then turns into the recording of a secret meeting between shady investors and housing developers plotting a huge, lucrative conspiracy. Gentlemen, we're here to sell the American dream, and Hollywood is our greatest advertiser. In less than three minutes, the conspirators expose their entire sinister scam on camera, which is convenient for Jack Kelso, but confusing for everyone else. The GI Bill is government money. There's a difference. What difference? The GI money ends up in my pocket. Who filmed this incriminating meeting? Why did they film it? Why did they then edit it with shots from multiple camera angles? And why did they then leave it in the movie studio from which the dangerously inadequate housing materials, repurposed from movie sets, were being taken? I need to find a game well or a telephone. We may never know. Have you tried rotating it back and forth a bit? Dr. Dr. Lee, Lee, it's Sarah Something Lyons. I'm in the control room. Please, We're both here. What's going on? I've been monitoring the equipment remotely, and we have a serious problem. It's the loophole that needs no introduction, but I'm going to do one anyway because I need my routines, otherwise I get all anxious. At the end of Fallout 3, famously, you're faced with a lethally irradiated control chamber that someone needs to go inside to activate a water purifier and save the wasteland. One of us is going to have to go in there and turn the damn thing on. And whoever does it isn't coming back out. The noble self-sacrifice option here means that someone is you. You volunteer yourself and wade into the control chamber, activate the water purifier, and die like a brave hero when, not pictured, your organs liquefy and skin falls off. Presumably. Or, and hear me out, Forks, the uniquely intelligent radiation-proof super mutant who is my companion and surely doesn't want me to die, why don't you do it instead? In the original version of the game, this was not an option because Forks had strong feelings about it being your destiny to die neck deep in deadly rads. We all have our own destinies, and yours culminates here. I would not rob you of that. Yeah, cheers, Forks. That ridiculous loophole, however, was patched over with Fallout 3 downloadable content Broken Steel, in which sanity prevailed, so now you can send Forks in. I would say that your destiny lies within that chamber, but you have already altered mine. The least I can do is return the favor. Now though, if you make Forks get in the control room and activate the thing, at zero personal cost to him, instead of doing it yourself and dying, you receive bad karma for no readily apparent reason. Why am I the bad guy? Radiation's good for him, I expect. So I just basically did Forks a favor, and yet when it comes to the end of the game, I get sassed by Ron Perlman, who intones that Forks, who risked nothing, is the true hero. But the child refused to follow the father's selfless example. Instead, allowing a true hero to venture into the irradiated control chamber of Project Purity. Unbelievable. I'll be the first to admit, I don't have a great memory for faces. Just this morning I ran into Jane and I totally blanked. That was awkward. That was me. Sorry, who are you? <laughs> My forgetfulness, however, has nothing on the Civ-like memories of the main characters of Final Fantasy VIII, who until halfway through the game have completely forgotten that they all grew up in the same orphanage together. Now that's awkward. Several hours into the game, with the cast of teenage mercenaries having been drawn together from disparate places by various forces, they take a breather on the ruins of a basketball court. It's here that cowboy cosplayer Irvine Kinaeus casually brings up the orphanage. Nice shot. Also, go on. As Irvine shares the memory of his orphanage years and the kids he grew up with, the player and eventually the other characters come to a stunning realisation. <music> a 
As their collective memories come rushing back, they come to recall that all of them, minus Renoa, were a tight-knit little band of orphan friends in the seaside orphanage, growing up together, forging childhood memories both precious and melancholy. <laughs> there, judging his younger self for being a sad orphan. That is brutal. Not only did our lead characters grow up together, but the lady running the orphanage was, twist, none other than Adia, the powerful enemy sorceress. As a plot twist, this is all either the greatest coincidence in the history of the universe or incredibly significant and meaningful in a way yet to be fully revealed, you assume. So why? Did no one mention it before? The game suggests that the summonable guardian forces from which these teens draw their powers also wipe their memories. So I guess everyone is walking around with unexplored childhood amnesia. Except, what about Irvine? Irvine hadn't used a guardian force until just recently, so all his memories are perfectly intact. In fact, he recognised everybody the moment they met, so why didn't he mention it? Okay, he was annoyed that no one else remembered, so he said nothing. About the powerful sorceress trying to take over the world? Who raised them? What do you have to say for yourself, Irvine? At this point, we probably wouldn't comprehend it even if we talked about it. Either it's a plot hole, or he is an a-hole. I'm the origami killer. I black out, and then the murdering starts. I know it's me. In Sad Dad Misery Simulator 2010, or Heavy Rain as it's sometimes known, world-class sad dad Ethan Mars has one of his offspring die in a tragic traffic accident, and the other one kidnapped on his watch. Sean! Where's Sean? To spice up the parental misery, Ethan is also experiencing unexplained blackouts where he loses time and wakes up someplace else. In fact, it's during one of Ethan's unexplained blackouts that his son Sean disappears. Sean! I've got to find Sean. I left him alone in the park. Ethan also wakes up holding origami, which would be a nice sign that at least he spent his blackout doing something creative, if only serial child murderer the origami killer wasn't out there leaving pieces of folded papercraft on his victims. Maybe take up knitting, Ethan. I would. Someone check there's not a knitting murderer. All in all, Ethan looks more suspicious than a completely empty browser history, but then past a certain point in the game, the blackouts stop happening, mercifully letting Ethan focus on surviving Saw-style torture games you have three minutes and 30 seconds left. and making out with Madison Page, who is super into his whole sad dad deal. So what was up with the blackouts? What was causing them? And why did they always lead Ethan to Carnaby Corner, the place where the actual origami killer grew up and lost his brother in the accident that would set him on the path to becoming a paper-folding child drowner? Behind the scenes, the explanation is that over the course of making Heavy Rain, developer Quantic Dream originally had Ethan's blackouts being caused by a telepathic link to the killer that they later ditched while keeping the blackouts. However, no in-universe answer for Ethan's affliction is offered by the text of the game or the subtext or the text back from David Cage that we still haven't received. Come on, David. Jesus, I sh shot myself! Ugh, I shot myself! Back up, back Stupid up! Stupid gun. Hold on, Chloe. The Life is Strange series is about sensitive young adults getting to grip with life, love, and superpowers like Professor Xavier's gifted youngsters, but with more indie music. There's something I have to tell you. I discovered I could reverse time. The first and best superpower in the Life is Strangerverse is that of Max Caulfield, waif-like protagonist of Game 1, who can bend time itself to her will in order to, uh, get some tools out from under a cabinet? No can reach. The awesome power of time. The puzzles on which Max brings her time-warping power to bear are not always this prosaic, but it always works the same way. Move your head. If you insist, Max. Max rewinds time around her while staying in the same physical spot, acquiring items or making different decisions in a supernatural do-over of the moments she has just used her power to revisit. 
Now I need to find Nathan's phone. However, on the dramatic first occasion that Max uses her heretofore unknown power, it works completely differently. She's in the bathroom when she witnesses school jerkass Nathan Prescott hassling her future BFF Chloe Price, then shooting her. Get that gun away from me, psycho! No! At this point, Max uses her power to rewind time and undo the shooting, then is startled to find herself back in her classroom where she was a few minutes prior. Whoa. What the f***? Which is a great outcome for Chloe, but also a total inversion of how Max's powers work on every other occasion for the rest of the game, where she is the one human completely unaffected by time reversal. How did this happen? What does it mean? Why does it never happen again? If I know one thing about time travel, it's best not to think too hard about it. And if I know two things about time travel, it's don't get it on with your grandparents. Actually, that rule's good for whenever. The biggest problem with time travel is getting the outfit right. You tell me where I'm supposed to find 16th century nether hose with one day's notice. The other, less critical problem with time travel is the risk of a temporal paradox, and that's only really a problem if you're a big crybaby about causality and logic and not destroying the space-time continuum. Hey, it had its chance. Lucky for us, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time has no such qualms about creating brain-melting time paradoxes, and so it is that time-hopping hero Link meets the furious windmill keeper Guru Guru. This dude teaches Link the Song of Storms, saying he learned it from some kid who played it to him seven years prior. Having acquired this hot new bop, Link goes on to travel back in time seven years, where he uses the Song of Storms to drain the village well and mess up the windmill, thereby teaching the same Song of Storms to the younger version of the windmill guy, and bam, that's how you get yourself a time paradox. If Link learned the song from the Windmill Dude, and the Windmill Dude learned it from Link, where does the Song of Storms actually come from? Who knew it first? And how did Guru Guru maintain his fury for seven long years, yet forget what Link looks like? This is what us time-travelling veterans call a bootstrap paradox, not to be confused with the give me your clothes, your boots and your motorcycle paradox, which is not so much a paradox as what happens when you're doing the kind of nude time travel where your clothes can't travel with you. I told you, the hardest part is getting the outfit right. Thanks so much for watching this video, folks. Uh, please do like and subscribe if you enjoyed this. And I, I, look, I really need you to watch one of these two videos, preferably both, because I need enough money to afford a Skyline so I can realize my vision of a movie with Vin Diesel driving a Skyline around. It's the, the, my most important creative endeavor. Forget all this, not the videos, obviously, but this is my true calling. Is my it true. Just fast and yes, but it's called something else. It's called fa uh, fast and quick. And angry. quick yeah, yes, yeah. Fast and spurious. Yes. Watch these videos, please. I need the money. <laughs>